Welcome back. As always, here we are with a new subject. So, today we're taking a look at the Dirty Pipe vulnerability, courtesy of Max Kellerman. Um, he did a very good job documenting his process of figuring out what this bug was. I've briefly skimmed through the article, and I've done a little bit of research, but um, let's just step through this as we go and see what it means to perform uh, scientific experimentation. So here, Kellerman writes that this is the story of this CVE, a vulnerability found in a Linux kernel. And the kernel's the piece of the operating system that handles many different privilege escalation and resource management and scheduling and interruptions and these sorts of really high level or low level things, depending on how you look at it. Um, so yeah, this is a story of a, a vulnerability in that kernel that affects every Linux distribution for the 5.8 series, uh, leading up through the 5.16 series through 5.10. It was fixed in each of these versions. Um, more recent years, the Linux, uh, kernel development team has been doing releases much more frequently. In previous years, uh, there would just be a hesitation to uh, do major releases, uh, I guess for fear that something might break. And now the Linux kernel development team has uh, a regular cadence and pace and release cycle. And so this enables them to release more frequently and to recommend that those uh, operating system vendors and people receiving this kernel frequently upgrade. So, um, yeah, for what it's worth, this is found since 5.8, but was, I think, uh, actually identified and isolated in the 5.10, as we'll see below. Or rather, was identified and isolated in one of these various versions that this author was using. But this is, I guess, the long-term uh, support LTS release. Uh, I guess this was a newer version, and this is a uh, not-quite-as-new version. I know there's some designator called Stable that they use for it. Anyway, um, the nature of this defect or bug was that a privilege escalation could be exploited because a process that doesn't have privileges was able to inject code into processes that were run as the root, the administrator account. And there's a whole variety of CVEs you can find. Uh, unfortunately, bugs do exist in the real world. And as they're identified and isolated, um, these announcements do go out upon a fix being available. Um, so initially, this CVE started a year ago with a support ticket about file corruption. The customer complained that the access logs they downloaded could not be decompressed. Indeed, uh, there was a single corrupt log file on one of the log servers. It could be decompressed, however, gzip, the tool for performing compression or decompression, reported a cyclical redundancy check error, CRC error. So. Yeah, this author couldn't figure out exactly why the file was corrupt, but they just assumed that some nightly split process crashed and just left behind the corrupt file. And they fixed the file CRC manually, closed the ticket, and soon forgot about it. And that, I mean, sounds reasonable as a first approach, right? And how many people do you think went through this same process that... You know, they're serving other folks and, uh, okay, a file seems corrupted, but you're able to look at it, recover it, and uh, close the ticket and move on. And this happened again and again, and again you could think, well, maybe there's something happened with our process that deals with these files. But you could still dig a little bit deeper, and uh, actually you find this a surprising pattern. And, okay... Now that you've got this uh, pattern that's emergent, what do you do? Okay, and here's some background information is provided. Again, the author's name is Max Kellerman here. Um, so, uh, let's see, sorry, I skipped around. 
So he explains how in this hosting environment, each web server sends UTP or UDP uh, multicast datagrams. So that's in differentiation to TCP. Um, this is the asynchronous non-redundant model, um, which just uh, yeah multicasts its way out over the network. And this is these are all received using uh, on the log servers using a program that's uh, their own custom open source in memory database. And then the nightly job splits the access logs of the previous day, uh, each and then compresses them all with Zlib. Um, so anyway, what that means is that they have their own hosting software that communicates one program to another in a way that seems efficient, but doesn't have the same redundancies that other technologies may offer. Uh, but also it's a custom open source in-memory database that they're working with. So there's a lot of pieces to this equation or puzzle. And so potentially any one of them could be a point of failure, but the more you work with tools that other folks develop, the less likely you are to encounter failures that are unique to yourself. Regardless, uh, via HTTP, all access logs of a single month or of a month can be downloaded as a single gzip file using a trick. Uh, it's possible to concatenate all the gzipped files together without having to decompress and recompress them all. So yeah, this is a trick that saves memory bandwidth, etc. And Windows users can't handle the gzip files, but everybody can extract zip files. So it's just a container around the gzip. Um, and you may or may not recognize certain characters that surround the gzip. Uh, there's a sequence, of, I think, at the head and the tail of a zip file that makes it unique with respect to what a gzip file would normally look like. So, yeah. So here is an example of what the end of a proper daily file is with the sync flush, which indicates uh, just write everything out to the file end of writing. Um, and then there's an empty final block. And again, you could look up the details, the gzip and the zip file structure and such. And then following the finality of the file, um, the data, then finally there's the CRC 32-bit, uh, along with the uncompressed file length that preceded it all. And so, yeah, if you have the same file, but it happens to be corrupted, you see a lot of these uh, values, like the 00FF over here, over there, are all the same. Um, however, the tail end of this here does differ. And perhaps some bytes over here do as well. Uh, but here's the value they're trying to write out, the 00600. Oh, wait, no, that's the memory address, rather. Here's the values that are at address 600, which uh, don't exactly match up. So here we have the 03 and the 00, and then some different values. Um, so here's the terminator, the empty final block, but the uncompressed length is now 1.3 megabytes rather than whatever it should have been as in the previous example. The, the CRC check doesn't match, and what's going on? So um, here he compiled all the known corrupt files, or rather he compared them all, and he found that actually each of the corrupted files had exactly the same CRC value and the same, quote, file length value. So, okay, this isn't a result of a CRC calculation because the calculation is not going to produce the same value for different inputs um, unless there's something severely flawed with the calculation, but you would think you would see that on other ways. Um, so rather, you know, the corrupt data, they would see, you would expect to see different, but still wrong CRC values. So this author spent a while 
staring into the code and could not find an explanation. This is a relatable thing that if you are operating both in operations and in development, sometimes you'll find yourself doing this sort of thing where you just stare into the code. What can you do? You can just look and look and look and look and ultimately because this doesn't yield more information most of the time uh, you're not writing in a language that provides you lots of protections or makes it easier for you to write things that are guaranteed to work staring a code is very unlikely to yield a solution staring with the aid of a debugger running through live simulations might help it might not help i don't know uh, then he looked back at the data. So this is not code, this is data. This is an example. This is different than staring at code. This has some promise of being productive. Um, not much, but maybe you can decipher or decrypt something by just by staring at the numbers. Actually, he realized that uh, this 504B in the corrupt data are ASCII for P and K. Well, actually, P, K are the f bytes in the header of a zip file. So, yeah, it says, let's take a look at these values again. And looking at it the same way every time might not be useful. So here, if you'd looked at it with a proper tool, it would indicate the ASCII value for each of these characters. P, K, 0, 1, 0, 2, is a code for a central directory file header. I couldn't tell you exactly what that is, um, but presumably has something to do with their proprietary software. Uh, the version made by um, is, yeah, here's the version that produced the central directory file header. So this could be some descriptor of the file system, I suppose. And the version required to extract is uh, 20 or 2.0. And yeah, the this header apparently got truncated after 8 bytes. And so this is really the beginning of a zip. Oh, okay, I see. This describes not a file system, but rather a zip central directory file header. Which, yeah, it really doesn't seem coincidental. But the process which writes the files has no code that's capable of generating such a header. So then he looked at Zlib and other libraries and tried to find anything capable of generating these values, and he couldn't find anything quite like that. So yeah, this particular software didn't know anything about the, this PK header. Um, now, incidentally like if you're going to suspect all these other things maybe it would be possible to link your code with some other library or i don't know what you could do but um yeah continuing to just look and look and look at code sometimes yields answers but machines tend to be really good at assembling and analyzing code humans not quite so much but you could still sometimes do this uh, or rather, you could do it. It's just not really the best approach when you have other tools available, unless for some reason you can't get those other tools working. Um, there is a process which generates PK headers, though. It's the web service, which constructs the zip files on the fly. But that web process runs as a different user, and that different user doesn't have write permissions on the files. So it couldn't possibly be that process. So none of this made sense. Um, but new support tickets came, kept coming in, although at a slow rate. So there was some systemic or systematic problem. But he couldn't identify it yet. And, you know, I guess if he's in a position where he's the one, only one working on this, I suppose that could be frustrating. Although, if it's not happening very frequently, you could push it off and, again, you assume that other people were in a similar situation 
at other companies and you think well okay a lot of people may i don't know he's not going to be the only person that has this issue although one well, he may be in the one case that he might be the only person using his particular proprietary software up here or rather their own custom open source in memory database so if other people aren't using that or there could be other things that are different about the hosting environment maybe he is the only person that encounters this but anyway he just keeps pushing this back because you know it doesn't happen often but when it does happen it's annoying okay and then external pressure brought the problem back up and so you scan the disk for corrupt files which took a couple days hoping to find more examples and so here's the pattern and there are 37 corrupt files in the past three months that occurred on 22 days 18 you have a single corruption uh, november 21st has two november 30th has seven december 31st has six january 31st has four corruptions so the last day of the month clear the one that caused the most corruptions okay uh, only the primary log server had corruptions, uh, and the primary log server is the one that serves the HTTP connections and constructs the zip files. Standby servers had no corruptions. Data on both servers were identical, minus the corruptions. So, yeah, do you question the hardware, or... Nah. You know, this would be very... Yeah, this doesn't look like a hardware issue at first. Could the machine be haunted? Maybe. Could it be faulty hardware? Maybe, but this looks... How could faulty hardware generate such a reliable pattern? It would take some very specific kind of fault. If you really wanted to test this, you, you could test such a thing and deploy a different server with exactly the same configuration and identify, well, like, okay, just replacing the hardware somehow correct the issue um, and that might be the cheapest solution instead of uh, this but nevertheless we persist because um, you know these machines are finite and given enough time and effort you know eventually either you stare at enough code that it inspires you to think of ideas or somehow something reveals itself or i don't know some other stimulant x our outside influence dynamic changes this dynamic and you uh, think of some other possible thing like here there's a pattern and okay yeah you do want to like not have the pattern going on but if the pattern changes this might change your thoughts so um yeah, so he starts looking at this, uh, this time looking at the web service. So it splices all the data together and then uses write again to add the zip header. Um, and the data over the wire looks exactly like the corrupt files on disk. However, the process sending the data does not have write permissions on the files and doesn't even try to write to the files it's all it's doing is just reading those files so against all odds and against the impossible well it seems that like it's not possible that it's this web server that's breaking the files but you know that seems to be the um there's not an alternative hypothesis short of like cosmic rays and such which seems far, far less likely than this possibility. Um, so I guess, like, Holmes would argue, once you've ruled out the impossible, the rest has to be the truth. So, so his first flash of inspiration was that, well, it seems that it's always the last day of the month that gets corrupted the most, or has the most evidence of corruption. And so when a website owner downloads the access log, pulling an entire month's worth of logs, the server starts the first day of the month and the second and so forth. Of course, the last day is sent at the end of the file, and last day is tend to be the file that gets corrupted. So that's why the last day is more likely to be corrupted 
than the other data files that were zipped earlier in the month. Um, but he mentions in post-mortem analysis, he found that other days could be corrupted if the requested month had not completed. But this is less likely than the files being downloaded at the end of the month or after the end of the month. So, well, how is this impossible thing possible then? Okay, so more and more hours pass. After eliminating everything that was definitely impossible in his opinion, and you know, this is a relatable thing, uh, not exactly scientific jargon here, but um, again, a relatable experience if you're dealing with people that deal with computers. Sometimes you're told one set of assumptions and then those assumptions get violated because computers are made by people, software is made by people, hardware is made by people, firmware is made by people, all these things Although many, uh, the manufacture of any of these things is automated, there is some manual um, interaction with the process that results in a computer existing and doing things. So there's always a person somewhere involved in all of that. And so, uh, yeah, these things that we call, uh, so, Sometimes we have difficulty coming up with language that can describe these difficult situations where um, yeah, you're trying to rule between classes of things that you expect to be possible or not possible based on all the assumptions that you're given. Uh, I don't know that I would have written it exactly this way, but he concludes that a kernel bug must exist. Um, and so, yeah, blaming the Linux kernel, something very, very heavily used by millions of users um, for data corruption, has to be your last resort because it's extremely unlikely. It's a, a very complex project built by thousands of individuals that methods that at first seeming chaotic uh, still result in an extremely stable, reliable product. But this time he was convinced, having rejected alternatives, that like the most likely possibility is actually a kernel bug. And so, you know, it's kind of impressive at this point. And I've had moments in my career and in, in my hobby development where I've enjoyed extraordinary clarity. It's an impressive moment. Um, is that something to be to aspire to? I'm not entirely sure about that. You don't want to have to do this sort of heroic effort on a routine basis, and you don't want to have to rely on doing these sorts of routine or heroic things um, because you're not always going to be able to be the hero. You'd much rather try to socialize your concerns and try to um, collaborate with other folks and try to solicit their input and thoughts about what do you think could be causing this, if for no other reason that even after you've proven something in this moment, uh, it might not be possible to other convince other people that you are correct, even if you have the most convincing proof ever. Uh, all these systems are produced by humans, and so um, your interpretation is not necessarily any more valid than, than theirs is. But anyway, uh, in this moment of an extraordinary clarity, he hacked together two programs. So this is finally getting away from staring at code. Staring at code might be fun, it might uh, pique your interest and such, but at some point you have to try things. Um, Sometimes you have to try even very radical ideas to get a, a, a deeper understanding of how the software functions and the hardware functions and such. So one program would keep writing out odd chunks of the string AAAA to a file, just continuously writing to standard... Uh, wait. 
So there's a 0, 1, and 2. 0, I think, is standard in. 1 is standard out. So just continuously write to pipe number 1, this 5-character string, over and over. Uh, it's a pretty simple program, right? And then you could say, okay, we're going to run this program and redirect output from standard out into a file we're just going to call foo. And then program number two, it, it's a program that keeps transferring data from that file to a pipe that using splice, and then write the string bbbbb -b 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 to the pipe. So here you're taking data from a file, splicing it together, and then writing bbbbb, um, like creating a zip file or something similar, although without the pk and those other characters for the central file directory and such. We're just going to take whatever get written to this file foo, and we're going to read from foo and concatenate it together. And in fact, not even dump the file output in a different file. We're just going to like completely dump the output for, to cat, going to concatenate it together and or read from this pipe and redirect to null because we don't need this output anymore. So then you copy these two programs to the log server and actually reproduced the file corruption with these two very trivially simple <laughs> trivially no not really but these two simple programs um and if you were doing slide code pseudocode you could probably simplify this further but um no he's this point is that he's using splice and write here and so he's trying to read uh, from this input file that he's only got read permissions to read from he doesn't have permissions to write to and um, concatenating the, the contents of the file together and then dumping some Bs and uh, that dump and for this case he's sending to null but you could send it back out to the console or something like that but what he's trying to test is can he corrupt this file foo can he put a B character into this file that should only have A characters in it and actually, yeah, so now this string bbbb starts appearing in the file, even though nobody wrote this string ever to a file. So actually, yes, this uh, he's calling this a kernel bug at this point. And given what follows, he's not wrong. Um, yeah, you could argue, like, this doesn't necessarily prove a kernel bug, but... You know, it's at some point, um, either you're going to argue that one of these functions doesn't do exactly the thing that its library documentation says, or you're going to argue that, like, the compiler did something wrong or some other tool did something wrong. But no, this actually is a kernel bug. Um, and so, yeah, once you can reproduce a bug in isolation, um, it becomes much more shallow. You know, I'm not so sure if... I think some words are probably missing here. So, yeah, once you can reproduce a bug on demand, it becomes possible to take away... It becomes possible to experiment further. Uh, to devise things like this, or otherwise, like on some development server, make radical changes and do your best on your own, or more likely in collaboration with other folks and their ideas to try to isolate what's going on. And if you're having a lot of difficulty isolating what's going on, um, this might require some negotiation to get more information, or who knows. It can be sometimes challenging to completely isolate a thing, but uh, software development teams have to do this sort of thing all the time, unfortunately. Uh, although uh, teams can prioritize their work, so something that's this vexing might not be their top priority for a long time until whoever brings it to the top of their priority list can maybe help them out and help them get more information or interface with folks and 
negotiate. Uh, could we try setting up another server? Could we try this? Could we try that? Do we have permission to do a wide variety of things here to try to isolate this better? Um, but anyway, now this actually is a kernel bug, and so now once it's reproducible on demand, it becomes a shallower bug. And a quick check, running this particular set of programs against various operating system or kernel versions um, identified which versions were and were not affected. So uh, Linux 4.19 was not affected. Linux 5.10 is affected. And I think at that point you have some certainty that, well, okay, this doesn't really seem related to my particular program that I'm running, it seems much more related to uh, these two versions of Linux, unless something changed about the compiler or compiler flags or some subtle nuance therein. But here you have enough evidence um, uh, to start looking and start asking questions. And if you're familiar with Git tools, you can use Git bisect and look try experiments up and down a history um, and figure out, well, which version exactly between this and that introduced the bug if you're compiling your own kernel. If you're not compiling your own kernel, you maybe don't use git bisect to do this, but you just uh, try, uh, try whatever is halfway between this one and this one. Um, or maybe you just have the resources. You could quickly spin up a whole bunch of virtual machines for every kernel version therein. And probably not, but uh, do whatever makes the most sense. Here, he actually identified right down to the commit ID. This is when um, the behavior of these two programs changed um, around there, which refactors the pipe buffer code for anonymous pipe buffers. Um, so, uh, we'll get down to that much later. I'm not going to reread everything. I do encourage you to read, um, this, uh, blog post. I'll link to it, uh, next to my video description. But, uh, we'll just skip to the summary here. So, yeah, long ago, a struct called, a data structure called pipe buffer operations had a flag called can merge and some changes were made in the kernel that affects um, the merging of pipes together um, and so this is refactored back and forth which seems innocuous enough right um, so yeah there more and more and more background is offered as to how the Linux kernels developed I apologize for skipping over this, but I think um, most viewers, listeners, readers uh, probably would get overwhelmed by the details, as I'm even I'm starting to get a bit overwhelmed, although I did read through this beforehand. Um, so yeah, many files can get spliced, and well, I'm sorry, first some data gets written into a pipe, then additional files are spliced into the pipe, which some of which might have this flag can merge set some might not have this set right or randomly this may or may not have this flag set um if they are set then the right call writes the central directory file header um, from the last compressed file but why are only the first eight bytes of that header written actually all of the header gets copied into the page cache, but um, the total file size of the target file is not changed. Um, the original file had only this much unspliced space at the end, so there's only so many bytes which can be overwritten during this merge operation, and the rest is discarded. And so why doesn't this happen more often? because the page cache does not write back to disk unless it believes that there is a dirty page. Um, so the accidental overwrite in the page cache doesn't actually dirty the page, 
if not no other process happens to dirty it, this is just some ephemeral thing. So yeah, this uh, accidental overwrite of data in the in-memory representation of the file that's on the disk, that overwrite is an ephemeral thing that doesn't really affect your disk, doesn't affect your storage. And so, yeah, uh, it's just not a dirty change at all. Um, yeah, or if the kernel decides to drop this page from the cache, for example, so say the machine's running low on memory, um, then the machine, <laughs> this is actually funny, isn't it? So under this, this bug would never have been observed under the case where the machine is under memory pressure unless somehow pages appeared to dirty while they were being accidentally overwritten. But if the machine's under heavy memory pressure, then this in-memory overwriting might have resulted, might have resulted in uh, files never getting written back to disk in this case, even if, uh, so unless somehow they were marked dirty before the machine needs to reclaim memory. Um, so, yeah, so originally these programs up here, these test programs, the A and the B, um, that's not really an exploit, right? It's just a bug. So the next thing to think about um, is, is how serious is this bug? Is anybody likely to help you fix it? Um, so, yeah, in this first exploit, you just assume this is only exploitable while a privileged process writes the file and that this bug depends on the timing. But given the evidence above, it was able to widen the hole by a large margin. It's possible to overwrite the page cache in memory representation of a file that could be uh, or part of a file, a page, that could be written back to the file system if it becomes dirty. So, yeah, even in the absence of writers, even like with no timing constraints, at seemingly or almost arbitrary positions using arbitrary data. So, under these very particular circumstances, where the attacker has to have read permissions already, the offset cannot be on a page boundary um, because then there would be no bytes that you could actually write into this page to dirty it. This has to be before a page boundary so you have the opportunity to dirty it. Um, then the write cannot cross the page boundary, um, I guess because yeah, the kernel allocates a new anonymous buffer rather than dirtying the existing uh, buffer. So the kernel bug isn't uh, triggered in this case. It's only the case where you're writing within an existing page and not writing over the boundary. And the file cannot be resized as a result of this um, because the pipe has its own page fill management. Uh, let me think about this one. Um, The pipe has its own page fill management and does not tell the page cache how much data has been appended. Um, well, okay, yeah, I guess your CRC checks and such are going to fail if you try to do something that changes the file size. Uh, although that's only really for the gzip and zip file format, but basically what you're writing cannot cross page boundaries, but also cannot change the file dimension if you want this exploit to actually um, corrupt files, but in a way that uh, can be used to gain further privileges. So to do this, step one, create a pipe. Spoiler, a lot of programs create a pipe, a way of joining 
uh, input and output. Fill the pipe with arbitrary data. Drain the pipe. Splice data from a target file into this pipe just before the target offset. So yeah, what you're trying to do is corrupt the target file. So you need to create a pipe, fill it, drain it, and then splice something from a file that you have read permissions for, and then write arbitrary data into the pipe, which overwrites the file, um, because the file page that's in memory um, gets written back to the disk. To make the vulnerability more interesting, it not only works without write permissions, it also works with immutable files, um, which I find a bit amazing, right? So this uh, works on immutable files, on um, a file system snapshot, which I'm not so familiar with this format. But even on like a read-only mount, including a CD-ROM mount, you'd be able to write out to it on this thing you don't have write permissions to. And even some hardware that's not capable of writing because it's a read-only device. Um, but yeah, this is because the page cache uh, can always be written by the kernel. And so, yeah, writing to the pipe never checks any permissions because that would be unnecessarily non-performant. So then he wrote a CVE exploit based on what he learned. Um, so, I mean, that's impressive. Uh, yeah, it was enough to impress the folks, um, the Linux kernel developers. So, yeah, uh, he has first support ticket in 2021. Then the next year, um, he identified and isolated this bug, and which uh, turned out to be exploitable. And then uh, the next day, came up with a bug report and exploit and a patch, which was very quickly integrated into multiple Linux kernel versions. And then Google merged his bug fix as well. And then the Linux distros mailing list and such were all notified. And the next month, uh, public disclosure went out uh, weeks after the bug fix has been merged. And... Um, yeah, the security team had recommended that consumers upgrade. So, wow, 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 what a story. Um, thanks again, uh, Max Kellerman from Ionos, or there, that's his email address, um, for sharing us the story of how he went about exploit or um, isolating this bug and then identifying that it actually could be used as an exploit and that quickly gained the support of Linux kernel development team to try to fix it. Um, I suppose given the severity of this um, he could have been reticent to share his findings with others especially because sharing those findings could potentially have resulted in an exploit um, uh, on his own hardware and network. So I could see why they have some uh, motivation to go it alone, uh, trying to identify and isolate this. At the same time, I do wonder, um, I mean, yeah, a lot of effort had to be exerted to produce uh, an exploit here. And he did manage to produce an exploit or proof of concept exploit. Um, and so, yeah, there's two major limitations of it, that the offset can't be in a page boundary, and it cannot uh, change the file size. Um, so, yeah, and the write itself cannot cross the page boundary either. So, yeah, I'm impressed. Um, yeah, this is kind of... The, write-up of this is every bit as impressive as the research effort. Um, but I think this teaches us what other uh, software experts tell us. 
um, which is that the human eye and brain and mind are good at recognizing patterns, but only in things that are visualized well to this. So code really doesn't have by itself a beautiful visualization or presentation. It's very difficult to pick out power patterns in code. Um, it's much easier for the human brain to pick up uh, patterns in data output or um, the results of other tooling. So at times you have to produce better tooling to help you figure out what's going on or figure out how, what tool is most apt to help you uh, do this, deal with this sort of thing. Um, yeah, so I'm actually curious if he wants to write more about his moment of extraordinary clarity that yielded this rather convincing example. Um, so it could just be that, um, I don't know, have, has, was staring at code the primary thing he did until he came up with this absolutely perfect way of reproducing the issue? Or um, did he try other things that aren't mentioned in here? How is it that a person develops this extraordinary clarity sense? It, maybe it's not developable. I don't know. Um, but yeah, generally, um, I guess unless you're in a system where you are a situation where you're not able to share things of this nature, um, trying to solve this sort of problem by yourself can often be quite challenging. And especially if you can't negotiate on um, what it means to like host various services. So he mentions in here that um, their primary server was the one that was affected and replica servers or other servers on the network that were operating the same software and had similar files were not observing the same issue. So... Um, yeah, it might have been necessary if this sort of discovery failed. Maybe it could have been necessary to go a step further and try swapping out hardware, try uh, changing various configurations to see, like, can we distribute this issue across multiple machines? Does it only happen on this machine? Under what conditions does it happen? Can we correlate this with other logs and things on that system. Um, there are potentially many different things that could be done, but maybe some aren't within um, the rules of the company or their policies or hosting provisions. So, yeah, maybe he needed to come up with this full elaborate solution on his own. Who knows? It is quite an impressive solution, and it's impressive that bug was well documented and uh, patched uh, very quickly. So yeah, the Linux kernel team recommended a course of action, sending a patch here to the Linux kernel ML. I'm not familiar, but uh, yeah, they sent the patch, uh, Linux uh, released with the patch and such. So let's take a quick look at um, Oops, didn't mean to look at that. Let's take a very quick look at the message that was sent to the team. Uh, so yeah, this is the, um, oh, the mailing list is ML. So he points out, hey, you know, um, can we make the kernel do this instead? Set flags to zero, set flags to zero. So when you are merging together um, an existing pipe with a new pipe, when you're splicing things things together, don't automatically give uh, or don't randomly give permissions, uh, such as write permissions to pages that are in memory. So this causes side effects elsewhere. So you don't want to accidentally allocate a data structure that's capable of writing to pages in memory that it shouldn't be able to write to. If 
there is a structure in memory and you're taking two data structures and combining them together and then the second structure or first one rather the existing file that you're reading from shouldn't offer this other program the ability to write to it you need some flag in memory to indicate that no you don't have write permissions to this structure so now there is an initializer setting this to zero and you know um i think brian lunduke of all folks talks about how the linux kernel is exploding in size um, and other folks talk about how do we get this back under control because if you go look at wikipedia you'll see that to try to redevelop the entire entire linux kernel is estimated as a multi-billion dollar effort uh, so that's not going to happen anytime soon so one possibility that's offered is maybe some of this these features and things that are traditionally handled by the kernel should be handled uh, using some other sort of language or framework outside of this kernel so um, some notion of a hybrid uh, system that perhaps uses rust more and more um, might help protect against accidental leaks of this sort that are tremendously difficult to observe. Again, the test that this offer points out is that once bugs are observable on demand, um, they uh, it's possible to fix them. But yeah, it's tremendously difficult to um, reproduce a bug or difficult to fix a bug once you can't see it. Uh, it's only once you can reproduce the bug that it becomes much shallower and easier to correct. But that initial discovery effort trying to figure out well when and where and how does this bug occur um, that becomes harder and harder over time. Especially if your project just keeps growing exponentially. Um, I thought there was one other point I wanted to make here. I'm not remembering what it is at the moment. Um, but yeah, at some point, uh, Kellerman points out that the process of kernel development, it may appear to be some kind of black magic to folks outside the kernel development community. And maybe it does seem that way. Um, so, and I, no doubt the development team has um, quite the reputation and they do a lot of testing and there is some method to their madness, no matter how complex things seem. Um, but yeah, if, uh, if this kernel weren't as complex, then it would be possible for folks to catch this much earlier in the process. But yeah, this sort of subtle bug that gets introduced, uh, it's, if you can't observe it, how do you fix it? You just don't until somebody actually observes it. Um, so um, I don't know what other morals of the story there are here. This is strictly from an engineering perspective, what it took to isolate and correct this bug. This doesn't talk about the business side of things or policies or such that why this was the better path as opposed to if there were any alternatives to be considered. Uh, sometimes you don't have the luxury of being able to negotiate um, and get more information or modify things just on a whim. So I hope that um, this exploration was interesting. I would encourage you to check out the full article as well as the set of linked articles. Um, so yeah, uh, this is the fix that was offered. And yeah, this looks much like what we were just observing there that you want to set these flags. Um, and so yeah, here we see there's uh, linux.git under kernel git torvalds. So um, sorry I'm lacking a exciting conclusion here but i think this was a good exploration hope we enjoyed looking at this together if either way have a good day